been changing a lot of these recently. This is an immersion, and as you can see, it's pretty corroded. What I'm gonna do is I'll take this home and I'll show you how to test one. Okay, so here's the immersion heat you saw. I've also brought along a new one. I don't believe they're the same size and they're not. Let me get the O-ring off of it. Now, just to make something clear, I'm not going to teach you how to change one of these because that takes a certain level of competency. Get over there. Well, I'm going to show you how to test them so that when you approach one of these, because they look exactly the same from the outside, you can't see this portion. You can test it and you could diagnose what's wrong with it. So regardless of whether you're going to be the one that changes it or not, you can pass this information on to the next person. Or there are some things you can do. For instance, you could change the thermostat. To begin with, let's remove the covers and I'll get my test meter set up. I'm going to want to do some continuity tests and I'm going to want to do some insulation resistance tests. I did talk about it in another video. I'm going to try and make myself have a testing bag because I'm just I'm just fed up of unknotting all my leads every time. It doesn't matter how neatly you stick them in there, they still come out as an absolute muddle. Do we need the probes? We'll put them there just in case. I think we just need our crockies, and I'll tell you what. Let's zero this whilst I'm here. And if you don't know how to zero a QTEC 64, you put it onto its continuity setting, you lock this off, only works if you lock it apparently, hit the null button and the tick will disappear. You put your crocs together, give them a pinch, make sure the connections are nice and tight. There you go, it says 0 0.78, that's the resistance of my leads, which is a bit piss poor, but this is a really old meter. I should really renew it, to be honest. Hit the null button, you get your tick, it goes to zero. And the best thing to do after that is to sort of manhandle it a little bit, as though you're sort of walking around someone's property. And see if it settles back at zero again. Beautiful, okay. That's that zeroed. Next thing I'll do is I'll take these off. Now, even though these two are different sizes, I'm not quite sure of the size of this one. I think it's either 14, but that's definitely an 11. And as you can see, they're different sizes. Even though they are different sizes, they are still three kilowatt. Most of these are three kilowatt, regardless of the size. These are side entry. You do get some very long ones, which are top entry. The difference between a lot of these is to whereabouts they're actually gonna be placed as to how long they are, just to make them more efficient when it comes to heating the water so they can get as much water around them as possible. These are the gubbings. There's your bits and pieces to restrain your cable and some nuts to put your, your CPCs on. This is a copper immersion. This is best in soft water to neutral water places. If you're going to be changing these in a hard water area, you should really go for like a stainless steel. This also has like a little pocket in here which contains a thermostat. Are these thermostats the same? They're not the same because this thermostat here I don't know how well you can see this, but there's a thermal cutout button actually on the thermostat. This one has its thermal cutout. I don't know how clearly you can see this. Let me try and move some of the cables around. It's thermal cutout. I thought it might be better if I put it as a side view. Is this button here. So what thermal cutout does is, obviously, as the name suggests, it's thermal, so it's heat related. If this was to get too hot, that will pop off rather than this be destroyed. Other than being called an immersion heater, it's actually also called a resistance heater. It's similar to the elements that you'll get in a kettle. I also think it's very similar to the elements that you'd get in a night storage heater. It works on the same principle. It's a resistance heater. Now, if the thermal cutout should ever go, they've made it quite easy 
just to push back in again. Remember that obviously turn the power off, you could imagine putting your finger in here between these two metal contacts, you'd get quite a whack, especially because it probably traveled from one end to the other end, because at the moment this is, this is breaking that circuit, you would have continued that, make sure the power is off when you do this. It might explain why on the slightly newer models, there's no chance of that happening when you reset that one. When the thermal cutout does go, it, it does sort of, it, you can limp by by pushing it back in, but the chances are it's probably on its way out. It doesn't go on its own. It's, there's normally a reason behind it. So when it does go, you normally should have to, you know, you're probably gonna have to come back and change this at some point. So I normally just let the customer go, say, look, this is probably gonna work for a little while, but the next time it goes, I'll come back with one of these and I'll, I'll replace it for you. Now I find these things quite interesting. They're quite old school. It's, it's still one of the things which doesn't have a lot of moving parts, circuit boards, things like that. Because of this, you can calculate whether there's anything wrong with it. Remember I said it was called a resistance heater. Because it works on resistance, you can use a resistance meter to see if this is working correctly. So for instance, you see this tube here looks a bit like a trombone. It has a live terminal and a neutral terminal. What you can do is you can get your resistance meter, you saw me, I'll put it on continuity. If I stick one, let's remove that thermostat. If I stick one on the live probe and one on the neutral probe, like that, you'll get a resistance there. And I've got 19.6, and I'll be honest, my math's not that good, so I'm gonna nip off and get my phone and quick do a quick calculation for you, so bear with me. So I'll do 240 volts. What I'll do actually, I'll, I'll put something on the side of the screen so you can see this, to see the calculation. I'll divide it by the resistance, and as you know, Ohm's law, I wanna get the amps. So if I divide that by 19 point, that move, five, it will give me 12.3 amps. Now this is a three kilowatt heater, and a lot of you know three kilowatts is not far off 13 amps. It's just below, so it doesn't pop a fuse. For instance, like in your kettle, like a lot of old kettles are 13 amps. Saying that, I'm gonna use this opportunity to say this, and it'll probably say it in the manufacturer's instructions if I delve through there. You should not put this on a 13 amp fuse. What I've seen in the past, people make this mistake. They'll run an immersion circuit off of a 20 amp circuit breaker, They'll bring it to a 13 amp fuse spur and then they'll run that into here. You shouldn't do that. A 13 amp fused fuse, when run at full capacity for a long period of time, will get really, really hot to the point where it could actually melt its way out of the fuse spur itself. Google it, have a look, there's some pictures online. You should not run a 13 amp, you can run a 13 amp fuse at three kilowatts for a very short period of time you should not run it for a long period of time. An immersion can be on for hours in an immersion cupboard. You should not put it on a fuse spur. It should be on a double pulse switch. It should be on a 16 amp breaker. That flex should be big enough to take 16 amps. And basically that's the way you should do it. Back to what I'm doing. I've got 12.3 amps. Now again, if we do another bit of Ohm's law, we've done the first little triangle, if you remember that at college. If I now times that by 240 volts, I'll get my watts. And as you can see, up in the corner of the screen, it's 2,953 watts, so 2.9 kilowatts. It's working absolutely perfect. It's below three kilowatts. It's not drawing too much as to you know what this is rated at. That is working fine. Now, let me test the other one. I'll be honest, there's a chance that could also be fine because the fault we had with this was not an overload issue. When I attended this job, the customer was telling me that when he was turning on the immersion, the circuit breaker was tripping. It's really important that you do ask the customer pieces of information like this. Now, if he had said to me that he's just getting no hot water when he's turning it on and the circuit breaker's staying up, I would probably assume it was a thermostat issue. But it wasn't that. The breaker was tripping off. If the breaker's gonna trip off, as you know, it's either gonna be a short circuit fault or it's gonna be an overload fault. So the first thing I did 
bearing that in mind was I checked the resistance of this trombone shaped piece here and on here I've got 20.5 now if I get 240 volts divided by 20 point oh it's gone to 20.4 and then that will give me my amps times that by 240 and it's below that one it's less so this is 2823 so it's not a resistance fault the fault is not that it, this is using too much power that's not the problem so I can rule that out so this piece this portion here hasn't gone faulty and to be honest it's very rare that it ever does so there's one other thing it can be what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my meter to insulation resistance and I'm going to test the insulation of this now I have seen some of these explode in a tank before where it literally rips open on the side and you can see all the bits inside it reminds me very much of a piece of MICC where you have this sort of metallic outer sheath and inside there's a single core that runs through and there does seem to be some sort of powdered insulation I'm gonna get my probes I'm gonna put it at 500 volts I've got it at 250 there. that's a safety measure I always leave this at 250 because sometimes if I'm sort of if my mind's elsewhere I might accidentally blow something up so I always leave it at 250 just to cover my ass I've got one probe on one of the line conductors doesn't really matter which one because as you can see they were connected we tested it first this metal out sheath is attached to this metal out sheath and it's also attached to this earth probe here so if I stick that on there perfect you can see from this there is almost a dead short there that has shown me that it was a short circuit fault there is a connection between line and earth or CPC and it's causing the breaker to pop so there's nothing more I can do other than change this to which I did I changed the unit and everything seems to be fine now that's two of the tests you can do what I'm actually going to quickly do I'm going to show you it on the unit which doesn't have any lime scale on so for instance again on that insulation resistance if I stick one on the earth probe here what you're supposed to do is run a nut down or you can always go right down to the bottom if you want you're supposed to get like a lug crimp crimp your CPC on it run him down again and then put your other nut on sometimes there's a couple of washers in here which there are I see a lot of people just they just wrap the earth around or wrap the CPC around and then they dump the nut I like to stick it in a crimp don't know it just just seems a little bit better it's not it's just not a very good connection otherwise is it stick it in a crimp put the nut on Bish bash bosh, that's how you get your earth potential to the out sheathing. And also, as you can imagine, the tank's metal, and so is all the pipe work. If you hadn't have done that, and this short circuit occurred, and it made all the outer portion live, a lot of the pipe work in the cupboard could also be live. So it's always good to get a nice good CPC connection on there. So one's on there, let's stick one on one of the live terminals. Doesn't even move, I'll try it again over here so that was the neutral terminal this is the live terminal that was a 500 volt shock that I just got <laughs> when I was an apprentice my uh, my governor used to put the test probes on this he used to set that to a thousand and he'd sneak up behind you and he'd do it on the back of your neck lovely alright so that shows the differences between one that works and one that doesn't work let's do some tests on this i might actually try and rig something up so you can see it working this is basically a switch okay and the switch works on heat so current will go into one terminal and it won't bypass it won't go from one terminal to the other unless this says so unless this says yeah, yeah i'm happy i'm going to call for heat i'm going to let you pass so when this is cold, which is it is, it's not in a hot water tank, this should have continuity. Um, the reason as such doesn't really matter, so I'll put that away. That's not important right now, so let's get rid of that. 
because I don't believe you get, I don't believe the res resistance differs. I don't think it goes up and goes down. It's literally an open or close. It's probably like a bimetal strip in there, which opens or closes the circuit. What I can use is just a set of standard voltage testers, which have a continuity setting, which this does. Now if I stick one on one terminal and one on the other terminal, like that, I will get continuity. Now that is the old one. And this is the new one. As you can see, both thermostats was working perfectly fine. Do you know what, just out of interest, should we check this uh, thermal cutter? So I didn't trick that, I don't think when I was on site. So if I do that, he's flapping in the wind, not doing anything, so he's not got any connections. Now if I stick one on one side, one on the other side, have I got continuity on the thermal cutout? I do. So the thermal cutout hadn't tripped. So as you can see, again, both of these are fine. I'm, I'm thinking I might do a little experiment. It's gonna be a little bit dangerous, but I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna get my test probes and I am going to fix one in one side. It's a good thing the wife's upstairs because uh, she won't be quite so happy with what I'm about to do. Wait there, don't go anywhere. Okay, I'm back. I want that. Don't want that. It's gonna make a god awful noise for a little while. If I do that, you can visually see that it's on. Okay. I'm gonna try and warm this up and turn this off. I'm gonna try anyway. There we go. Let's try this again. The only thing that Corona's good for at the moment. All right, so it looks like if I do it right at the end, let's move that so you can see this. There we go, so that's off because it's reached the temperature, which triggers the, uh, I'm gonna assume a, a bimetal strip probably on the inside. Now, if I put this in here, cool it back down again, it opens the circuit back up. So I hope that made a bit of sense. So basically what I would do is first get the story from the customer what's happened is it simply not heating up or is it causing the circuit breaker to trip if it's causing the sand to trip i'd do my continuity and my insulation resistance tests if that's not the case i would check the thermal cutout and i would check the thermostat for continuity these do break which is why they're replaceable and they've got this, this easy little pocket to remove them from if that's the case it's probably something you can do yourself you can put this in do not override this okay this is used to turn this on and off to keep the water in the tank at a set temperature. If you remove this, you have made a kettle. It will never turn off. It will get hotter and hotter and hotter till eventually the immersion blows up. Do not remove this, do not bypass this. This has to be in there. If this doesn't work and you haven't got a new one, then they don't have hot water, simple as. You cannot bypass this, do not bypass it. You have to have a thermostat, most important part of the whole unit. All right, and on that note, it sounds like the kids are about to come down. So thanks for watching. I hope that was interesting. I hope that's um, helped you out a little bit. I get a lot of comments saying that these videos help people out, especially like the young learners. So I hope you found that useful. Uh, watch another one up there. Subscribe, make sure you subscribe because it helps me out a lot. Comments down there. 
And if you click the bell, you'll get notifications every time I do a video, okay? See ya.